These are the dead mountains in nice weather. Click. These are the dead mountains in rainy weather. Click. This is hiking here in nice February weather. Click. This is hiking here in February when it's not so nice. Click. This is Bullhead City across the Colorado River from our campsite. Click. This is our campsite. We are very close to Dead Mountain Wilderness, about 100 feet actually. This is the fence that the BLM hopes will protect the wilderness. It's possible to crawl under it and get in. At least there's no barbed wire. There is also an official entrance that you may find on your way out, which is how we found it. It wasn't always this way. In the 1820s, the intrepid frontiersman Jedediah Strong Smith led a group of fur trappers up this canyon, hoping to find a route through the mountains to reach the promised land of California. Alas, horses and men on foot found it easy going, but a series of low waterfalls made it too difficult for wagons, so Jedediah chose another route a little to the north. That trail became the Mojave Road, which you can still follow today. Fur Trapper Smith did come across a spring in this canyon and noticed images carved on rocks around it. He called it Picture Canyon. The wilderness area the canyon is now a part of hugs the California-Nevada border some six miles northwest of Needles, California, very close to the Colorado River, as we have said. It takes its name, the Dead Mountains, from the story that the local Mojave Indians used these mountains as a place to bury their dead. It's probable that the ancestors of these same Mojave were responsible for much of the rock art in the canyon. It's about a three-mile hike from the fence line to the spring, if you don't get lost. The spring is about halfway through the canyon, which is some six miles long. Very often, when you visit a petroglyph site with a group, there's much discussion about the glyphs you are discovering. However, when you stumble upon these glyphs after a long day of searching the wrong canyons, you may find yourself both lost and in a somewhat altered state of consciousness with this rock wall of glyphs beaming down on you. It's as if the human energy that created the glyphs has been somehow captured and is held by the very rock, and you sense an almost tactile connection with something emanating from the glyphs. You're tired from walking all day, of course, but you still can't shake the notion that something different is happening here that was absent in other parts of the canyon. Perhaps the fatigue makes it possible to experience this place in a more sublime way. Who can say? Drop by after a long hike and sit quietly for a while and see what comes up for you. There are mostly geometric and seemingly freehand designs here. They might be a record of what we imagine as the visionary states experienced by the glyph makers. Were these glyphs created by shaman and medicine men at this location because of the spring water below the glyphs? Surely a spring in a desert canyon like this was a special place. Perhaps some ceremony at the glyph site helped to ensure that the spring kept running. It's not running much anymore, so who knows? This is speculation to be sure, and you remind yourself that you don't really know much of anything about these rock engravings or how or why they're here which is a challenge, really, because it makes writing a meaningful narration for a video somewhat problematical. We, of course, undaunted, will ramble on regardless. This fine figure, for instance. Can we say he seems to be waving a greeting? And perhaps a big greeting at that, judging by the size of his hands? Well, we can, but probably a large hand means something totally different. And this one big horn sheep glyph, how did it get here? Is it later in time, as most sheep glyphs are? How did it end up here all by itself? The more abstract glyphs tend to get classified as archaic, which really means they go back so far on the timeline that we have little ability to connect with them, except perhaps through our own trance journeys. Trance journeys, in fact, may be the only way to connect with these images and to learn if there is universal imagery here, or if this imagery is specific to a certain period of human learning and experience. And since all things are connected, these glyphs are part of our own journey also, even if we don't readily recognize them that way. These cupules seem designed for seed grinding and occupy a special place directly in front of the glyphs. This grinding depression is larger and seems designed for something else. On our rainy day hike here, the cupules were filled with water, 
and the glyphs were nearly invisible, melting back into the rocks. Our experience was that water on glyphs makes them much harder to see, not easier. We almost walked past the site. Now spring has sprung in Picture Canyon, and the flowers are beginning to dress the place up by adding their dazzling colors to the canyon's somewhat drab appearance. There are exceptions, of course. This rock made me think of a large bowl of marbled ice cream. There are some indications of past habitation here, and the canyon was obviously once used as a throughway. Seen from above, the canyon slopes gently both to the east and to the west, and this possible site sits at the apex of the canyon so that all the water runoff would flow away from it, either to the east or to the west, so any flooding from a hard rain would be avoided. Only a hundred yards from the spring and but three feet above the canyon, it is in an interesting location. This could also just be a pile of rocks that took these positions purposely to confuse would-be explorers. Still, directly across from this site, high on the cliff, is this outlined cross that some say is related to the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl, who's associated with the morning star, or Venus, and sometimes the plumed serpent. There are quite a lot of crosses at this site. Of related interest is this petroglyph, possibly related to the Mayan glyph that also signifies Venus. There's certainly a similarity. And today's Mexico is only a short boat ride down the Colorado River from here. As archaeologist Steve Lexon is fond of saying, everybody knew everything about everybody. An ancient information, internet-like highway powered by walking it just took longer. One of our favorite conjectures is that these two cliffs represent spaceships. The first to arrive here was clearly an early beta design. It was followed by this better appointed flying device of similar shape, which clearly had individual quarters for its occupants. We are particularly taken with the landing feet. Nicely done, and possibly totally misinterpreted, we know. Seeking out rock art sites can sometimes help you connect with another point in time, although few of the glyphs hint at what kind of conversations these people might have had with one another, or whether in fact they were perhaps more telepathic and had less need for words and discussion. Our present world is so word-driven that it's hard to imagine getting along without them. The glyphs certainly imply some kind of mental imagery, but was it verbal? They could have had sounds or rhythms associated with them. Clearly they had some meaning or they wouldn't be here, and it takes a lot of work to make a good petroglyph. Try making a few sometime, but not here. This place belongs to a people of another time who left these images on these walls, perhaps for all to see who may come upon them. So have a good look if you pass this way in Picture Canyon. It is very picturesque. Fade out.